Nella nostra eh, presentazione ehm, introdurremo la nuova direttiva, la proposta per una direttiva sul copyright nel, ehm, nel, mercato, unico, nel mercato unico digitale. Eh, prima di ciò eh, provvederemo, forniremo un, il contesto nell'ambito del quale la direttiva si colloca per poi affrontare alcuni problemi eh, specifici eh, ad essa, ad essa ehm, collegati. Eh, io quindi ehm, do la parola alla, alla eh, dottoressa Furgal che inizia la presentazione <ride> e io subentrerò eh, successivamente. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the friendly introduction and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very sorry I will speak in English because, uh, ah, okay, the only sentence that I can fluently say in Italian is parlo solamente un po' italiano, uh, so unfortunately I will continue, uh, I will continue in English. So what we are going to talk about today is a bit of a historical uh, overview of how the, the new directive, the new copyright directive actually came to be. And what is the new copyright directive? This is the proposal which has been uh, tabled by the European Commission back in September 2016. So this is the directive that it's supposed to bring our copyright into the new digital single market. But the first question actually is, what is the digital single market and how actually the digital single market uh, came to be? So, okay. so, allora adesso in questa prima parte quindi introdurremo la direttiva ma prima di ciò la collocheremo nell'ambito del eh, mercato unico digitale e spiegheremo quindi innanzitutto di che cosa si tratta, cos'è il mercato unico digitale. Ok, thank you for your help, uh, but I will try to speak slowly so I hope I can be understood with, uh, as by as many people as possible. Uh, so the idea of the digital single market is not new, it's not the idea of the current commission, but it actually came to be back in 2010 when uh, the, um, the launch of the single digital agenda for Europe and one of the ideas of this agenda was the creation of a single digital market was announced of one of the seven flagships that were supposed to bring the European economy after crisis up to speed. So what uh, the Commission at that point was aiming at was a true single market for online content and services. At that point, we still didn't talk about uh, copyright. But uh, copyright was somewhere in our minds, of course, when we talk about content, when we talk uh, about single market. Uh, the first roadmap when it comes to copyright and the single market came a year later, in the year 2011, where in this communication on a single market for intellectual property rights, the uh, Commission um, outlined six key points of the single market for intellectual property, and one of those was... Okay, okay. Too quickly? No, 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 sorry. Let me so. Allora, la... <laughs> Um, Ula ha introdotto il, la le, il, il tema del single market, l'idea di avere un mercato unico digitale come un aspetto essenziale per riprendere lo sviluppo economico, economico in Europa, due aspetti, prima la strategia e poi la eh, comunicazione, rimuovere le barriere ma non si parla ancora di copyright, il tema sarà affrontato successivamente. Uh, yes, so in the, in the communication of the year 2011, Uh, the Commission aims at the creation of the single uh, digital market for copyright with the idea of removing the barriers uh, that the copyright was creating so that we can take advantage of the technological development and that we can actually secure the remuneration for the right holders for the new users that came up to be after uh, because of this uh, digital technologies. And at that point the Commission still considered the idea of the overall codification of copyright, so the introduction of the European Copyright Code, or even introduction of the single European copyright title. Allora, la Commissione eh, capisce che il, la riforma, una riforma del copyright può essere necessaria per lo sviluppo del mercato unico. Si tratta di rimuovere gli ostacoli che il copyright pone alla circolazione delle, eh, delle opere e di garantire una remunerazione alle attività, alle attività creative. Si pensa addirittura in questo, in questo momento di realizzare, una, di codificare, di fare una disciplina unitaria per il copyright, come sapete come è successo per la privacy e per altri, e per altri settori. Ok, grazie. Uh, so, uh, following its promise on the creation of the copyright framework 
for the digital single market, the Commission decided on two threats, two tracks of actions. So first, it conducted the it promised and conducted the review of the copyright rules. And in here, the Commission promised that it will follow the empirical data, that it will conduct impact assessments, uh, public consultations, so on and so forth. To some extent, it delivered. During the, the review of copyright rules, it focused on issues such as territoriality, harmonization, the further harmonization of the rights, limitations, exceptions, fragmentation of the market, and enforcement of the rules. The second track of the actions was a stakeholder dialogue, so-called licenses for Europe, within which Commission uh, formulated four groups, focusing on four different issues. And the idea in here was to get practical industry-led solutions that will help the Commission to develop this uh, copyright for the digital single market. The second thread didn't uh, actually prove that successful because only two out of four uh, groups actually came up with uh, some conclusions. And uh, the document which presents the, uh, the attitude of the Commission of this time towards the copyright and uh, bringing copyright up to speed with digital single market is the white paper of the year 2014. This is the paper that was never actually published. We know it because it has been leaked. Uh, so we know uh, its text is accessible. It's not really groundbreaking. But the important note that we can find in there is actually that for the first time it has been officially recognized that the framework that we have now, so the one created by the InfoSoc Directive of uh, year 2011, needs to be brought up to speed because it's not respective of the current digital development. Allora, quindi abbiamo due iniziative, da un lato rivedere le regole sul eh, copyright, cosa che come vedremo è stata in, eh, in parte realizzata, e dall'altro realizzare un dialogo con eh, i soggetti interessati, i cosiddetti stakeholders, ehm, dialogo che ha portato ad alcuni risultati ma solo in eh, due settori. Importante il eh, white paper eh, che fu ehm, mh, realizzato intorno al 2014, non distribuito ma ehm, insomma, in qualche modo, di cui in qualche modo si conosce il contenuto e dal eh, white paper si può evincere che la direttiva sul copyright, la cosiddetta InfoSoc Directive sulla società dell'informazione, non ehm, realizza per intero gli obiettivi che la Commissione aveva in mente. Uh. Yes, so as we can see, uh, this, uh, the review process was an inquiry but didn't really produce any results. However, uh, the, the idea of digital single market didn't die. As we know, it's one of the main priorities of the current European Commission and it has been announced as early as the year 2014-11 when Commissioner Juncker was uh, drawing up the guidelines for the new European Commission. So second priority in there was a connection of single connected digital market and uh, when describing <coughs> how to achieve this market, copyright was singled out straight away, and the mission to modernize copyright uh, has, been, uh, has been set from the very, very beginning. And in here, uh, what, what is important for the discussion later on, the promise was made to actually take ambitious legislative steps. So at that point, everybody uh, actually expected codification, accepted uh, uh, unitary copyright, as we know, that really didn't come to be as for now. Qui nel 2014 abbiamo la, le, le linee guida per la nuova ehm, commissione nelle quali si parla specificamente, esplicitamente di modernizzare il copyright e ci si attendono eh, iniziative eh, significative che però non si, no, non si materializzeranno. Uh, so the document which actually describes the initiative when it comes to uh, co when it comes to intellectual property and digital single market in general is the next communication of the commission as you can see the commission loves to issue issue communications when it comes to this topic so it's the communication of the year uh, 2015 uh, which uh, outlined the roadmap how to achieve this digital single market and one of the pillars on which this roadmap was based was better access for consumers and business to online goods and services. And among this pillar, uh, we were talking about the copyright modernization. So the commission here promised to take very blunt legislative steps that were, um, that at the beginning were supposed to be published in the year 2015. So we are still on the ambitious level. However, the approach that the commission taken at that point, it resigned from the, uh, from the, 
uh, unitary approach. So again, we talk <coughs> about reducing differences uh, between copyright of the member states. We talk about securing wider online access, but we still preserve the, the principle of ter territoriality. We talk about harmonization, but yeah, again, not codification or the unitary title. Allora, siamo nella strategia per il ehm, mercato unico digitale in Europa e l'idea è di eh, consentire un migliore accesso ai consumatori e ai, alle, alle imprese ai ehm, contenuti online, e, e, e contenuti e servizi online. Però ehm, in questo, a questo punto si eh, viene meno l'idea di unificare la normativa sul copyright, si parla piuttosto di ridurre le differenze e di armonizzazione. Uh, and now we'll talk uh, more about the uh, copyright directive itself. I don't know how much you can see, but this is the timeline of devel developments when it comes to copyright directive and what we actually have on the table at this very moment. As you can see, there is a number of steps, there is a number of communications, number of discussions, number of versions of the directive which has been issued. Now we'll focus on the, on the particular points of this timeline, but this is a timeline as it stands now with the last trialogue uh, discussion which took place on the 25th uh, of October. Allora, dopo aver fornito così il contesto nel quale si colloca la direttiva sul copyright, eh, diamo un'occhiata al suo sviluppo, alla sua evoluzione nel tempo e eh, ovviamente si tratta, come vedete, di un insieme di passi eh, complessi che danno idea anche dell'intensità del, del dibattito, delle pressioni a riguardo e esamineremo però solamente il risultato finale. Uh, so the most important document before the copyright directive came to be and all the other, uh, and all the other documents which actually uh, which, which compose the copyright modernization <coughs> package that we are discussing now came to be, we have the communication towards a modern, more European copyright framework. So it outlined the targeted actions that the Commission will take and proposals that are going to be tabled. So this is like the key document if we want to have a general overview what Commission pledged to do and what is doing when it comes to modernization of the copyright during this term to fit into the digital single market. So one of the, uh, the first area of intervention was ensuring wider access to content across European Union borders. And as I said, the decision was made to preserve the principle of ter territoriality. However, the Commission in here uh, decided to take a gradual approach. So we have the regulation on portability of content, we have the regulation on geoblocking. So we have uh, a bit of moderation of the ter territoriality rule, but it still is there. Uh, second area is adoption of exceptions to digital and cross-border environments. This is a very broad area where first the Commission decided to adopt uh, the Marrakesh Treaty that it, uh, this is a party of. So the treaty that basically um, um, uh, um, makes it possible to access copyright works for people who are blind or visually impaired. Uh, second, we have uh, exceptions that were adapted as a part of the uh, current copyright directive that we were discussing. So exceptions for text and data mining, teaching and heritage institutions. And also we had a big discussion on the panorama exception. Uh, which uh, was followed by the, by the public consultation that I will mention a bit later, uh, but we don't have any, any regulation coming our way in this department. Uh, the third area is achieving a well-functioning marketplace for copyright, and in here the Commission pledged to see, uh, the, um, to, uh, to see whether it, there is a need to look into the um, right of communication to the public, and we have proposals as our value gap and press publishers right that we'll also discuss later. And the uh, fourth area yeah, is providing effective and balanced enforcement system. So in here, the commission pledged to, to see how the directive on enforcement of intellectual property right is doing. Uh, also, the, we were supposed to have some legislative steps. It never happened. We only have a guidance communication. So as you can see from the very beginning, there is not really a lot of consistency what commission is pledging and doing. So we have an abundance of regulations, directive, communication guidelines. So a lot of different documents and sometimes it's really difficult to figure out what is actually doing and at what level. 
Ok, perfetto. <ride> allora, in sintesi estrema, siamo arrivati al 2015, Scusa. abbiamo eh, questo importante documento che indica gli obiettivi della Commissione, non c'è una eh, codificazione, non c'è un intervento unico, ma un insieme di eh, azioni e di, e di proposte, alcune delle quali saranno realizzate. Quindi quattro aree, obiettivo di assicurare più ampio accesso ai contenuti, quindi rimane la territorialità, ma viene in qualche modo eh, temporaneo. Eccezioni, ad esempio per eh, soggetti con eh, disabilità ehm, ehm, eh, o per le opere architettoniche, cosiddetto panorama. Abbiamo poi ehm, eh, l'obiettivo del, eh, del, del, del mercato e, del, e dell'attuazione coercitiva del copyright. Eh, quindi un, poi vedremo nel dettaglio alcuni di, eh, di questi interventi, comunque non, eh, cioè, si fa fatica in qualche modo a vedere di conoscere un piano unitario al di sopra che unifichi tutte queste eh, iniziative. Uh, and uh, one more point when it comes to the empirical data and empirical information, uh, information before the, the Commission proposed uh, the new directive. So the Commission decided to carry only one consultation which carried the role of publishers in a copyright value chain and the panorama exception. The reason for that is uh, before the Commission of the previous term in the year 2013-2014 actually carried a big uh, consultation on the review of the EUI EU copyright rules and uh, it was a very broad consultation and included around 80 questions with the two main issues so the right and its functioning and the exception so the commission asked about linking asked about the digital activities asked the, uh, about the exception asked about unitary copyright as well asked about the remuneration of authors so on and so forth so the data was already there in 2016 it decided to carry the consultation on publishers rights and on this panorama exception uh, because it said those issues at the point of the previous consultation were not on the table yet uh, so this consultation was supposed to aid the Commission. It aided the Commission to the extent that Panorama Exception was, uh, has never made its way to the, uh, to the new directive. As we know, the press publishers' right did. Um, Ok, so allora nel 2016 viene effettuata una consultazione pubblica limitata però all'aspetto dei eh, diritti degli editori, su cui ci soffermeremo più avanti, e dell'eccezione del paesaggio Panorama Exception per le opere, per le opere no, fotografie e di opere architettoniche. Eh, non vengono eh, affrontati altri temi perché questi erano già stati oggetto di un'ampia consultazione pubblica sul copyright nel 2013-2014. And in the end, we do arrive at our proposal for the uh, copyright directive in the digital single market, which was tabled by the Commission in September 2016. Uh, it was at this point also a part of the package, so it came together with another communication and it came with a very important impact assessment. And here, impact assessment was a document or is a document which is quite broad in its scope. It analyzes the different legislative options and uh, provides some empirical evidence which was gathered by the Commission itself, but also which was gathered by the outside bodies. For example, on the issue of press publishers' rights, we have uh, a lot of reference to the report prepared by the Deloitte uh, for uh, private contractors. So, uh, as you should know by now, the proposal straight away sprung a lot of controversies and criticism that we'll discuss in a bit. Ok, siamo arrivati quindi alla direttiva sul copyright, è parte di un eh, pacchetto legislativo più ampio ehm, ed è accompagnata da un eh, impact assessment, da una, da una valutazione dell'impatto e come sappiamo c'è stato un ampio dibattito controverso eh, su cui ci soffermeremo più avanti. Uh, and after, of course, the proposal by the European Commission, other uh, EU bodies started to discuss the, the proposal <coughs> and in all of the bodies, so in both the Council and the European Parliament, it sprang a lot of controversies and as you know, it's still in the works. When it comes to Council of the European Union, the proposal um, was discussed since November 2016 and our member states arrived to the compromise only in the May 2017. And even though we have this, uh, this mandate for negotiation that are now taking place and we have the compromise version uh, of, the, of the directive, uh, as we know, some states are changing their minds and one of those states is Italy, but I think uh, next speakers will, will talk more about that. 
And also I can, like from uh, example from my uh, home country in Poland, also we have some sort of discussions whether we are still supporting this directive or we are not supporting this directive, but no official statement has been issued yet. And of course at that point, the most controversial points uh, in the discussions in the Council of the, of the European Union were Article 11, so press publishers' rights, and Article 13 and the value gap proposal. Allora, la proposta raggiunge poi il Consiglio, come sapete nell'ambito nell del processo legislativo dell'Unione Europea ehm, devono convergere la Commissione, il Consiglio e il Parlamento e ehm, eh, il dibattito continua su punti controversi che esamineremo più avanti, in particolare sul diritto degli editori e sul eh, cosiddetto value gap. Uh, and now we go into the European Parliament. So when it comes to the European Parliament, first the, the proposal was discussed within the committees of the European Parliament. The responsible committee was the committee of the legal affairs. Uh, and here we had two reporters. So first reporter uh, for the committee was uh, Therese komodini kashia who, who unfortunately, for copyright, I think, uh, had to step down in October 2016 and has been, um, has been uh, in June 2017 and has been replaced by uh, MEP Axel Voss. Why I say it's a bit unfortunate for copyright? Because Therese komodini kashia was a bit more moderate reporter, whereas uh, our Axel Voss is a very strong advocate for the new copyright directive. Uh, you can see how, how uh, controversial this proposal was. The committee had to deal with around 250 amendments to this document. And this is not that big of a document, I can tell you. And apart from that, um, Yuri committee has been aided by the uh, opinions of three other committees, IMCO, ITRE and CULT. Uh, and the final report of the committee has been, uh, has been adopted only in June 2018, a year after the first, uh, the first date, because I think the, uh, at first they thought that the report will be adopted in June 2017, so we are already uh, one year late in the, in the process. Allora, il, il, la, la, direttiva passa, la proposta di direttiva passa al Comitato Affari Giuridici del eh, Parlamento, ehm, e il rapporteur è la eh, Teresa Comodini Cascia, poi sostituita da, eh, da Voss. Ehm, numerosi, più di 250 emendamenti, am, emendamenti, scusate, emendamenti vengono considerati e eh, si arriva con un anno di ritardo al voto finale in cui finalmente il rapporto viene approvato, la commissione viene approvata. Uh, so after our uh, report by Yuri was adopted, it has been uh, tabled to the plenary vote in the European Parliament. And um, in July 2018, we had the first debate and the first vote when we try, when uh, the Yuri Committee rapporteur, MEP Voss, tried to <coughs> fast track our copyright directive. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, for uh, a lot of uh, people opposing this directive, the report has been rejected and the deb debate in the European Parliament has been reopened. A new uh, round of amendments has been tabled by the MEPs, uh, which followed uh, with uh, the new vote on th in September 2018, where the compromise of the new copyright directive has been finally adopted. And uh, listening to the debate in the European Parliament, you can see that it, has, it, it wasn't really sure that this, uh, this compromise will be adopted because the debate was highly polarized and very, very emotional. Quindi allora alla fine arriviamo al 12 settembre 2018, in, eh, scusate il rapporto viene respinto quindi del, del Comitato Affari Giudici viene respinto dal, dal, dal Parlamento, un voto eh, plenario e eh, si arriva quindi alla, successivamente alla formazione di un compromesso ehm, in seguito ad una vivace, ad una vivace discussione. And this is where we are now, so the current, uh, the, the proposal <coughs> At this very, very moment, we have three versions of the directive. So we have the proposal which has been tabled by the European Commission, we have the compromise of the Council and the compromise uh, of the European 
Parliament. So at this very moment, three bodies are meeting together in the trialogue, uh, trialogue negotiation to try to find out the, current, the common solution which can be tabled for a plenary vote for the European Parliament into January. As you can see the dates, we are currently in the middle of the, of the trialogue uh, negotiations with the next session happening at the end of this month. In general, the trialogue negotiations are, um, are considered to be uh, a secret. However, uh, our very, very active MEP, Julia Reda, is at this very moment following her new project of keeping the public updated on the, on the current status of the trialogue. So if you're interested, you can follow how the, how the, how the directive is changing through her website where she's publishing the, the documents after, after uh, every meeting of the, of the trialogue. So the final vote at this very moment is being said that it will take place around January 2019. But as this directive is already, I think, laid by year and a half, uh, we'll see whether we arrive to the vote. Allora, adesso siamo nella situazione in cui la negoziazione tra il, la Commissione, il eh, Consiglio e il Parlamento si sta, si sta svolgendo e eh, come vedete sono già state insomma, ehm, eh, previste eh, alcune quattro, quattro sedute. Eh, è possibile avere qualche informazione su questa procedura collegandosi al link fornito dal eh, membro del Parlamento, dal ehm, Giulia, eh, Giulia, Giulia Reda. E il voto è atteso per gennaio ma probabilmente eh, potrebbe sditare in avanti il voto finale del Parlamento. Uh, so now we'll leave the procedural aspect of the, of the copyright directive a bit and discuss the main provisions of the copyright directive. So actually what <coughs> the copyright directive at this very moment has in it and what are the, the positions on those main, on those main uh, provisions of the particular bodies of the, of the European Union Parliament. Uh, so as an introductory note, what are actually the objectives that the copyright directive claims to, um, to fulfill. <coughs> so the first note should be that the main objective is actually the establishment and function functioning of the internal market. What is important is that the Commission has decided not to use its sole special competence for the legislation in the, uh, in the intellectual property field, but decided to go for the general competence to, uh, to legislate to help the functioning of the internal market. Apart from that, the Commission declared to further harmonize the copyright, the respect uh, for cultural diversity of the European Union, and of course, modernization of copyright framework to reflect technological development uh, and to remove the uncertainties which are at this very moment surrounding digital uses, especially cross-border uses, and ensuring uh, wider access to content online. Ecco, quindi vediamo rapidamente gli obiettivi del, eh, della direttiva ehm, così come individuati dalla Commissione, quindi l'armonizzazione, la promozione della diversità culturale, la modernizzazione del copyright affinché tenga conto delle eh, nuove, eh, nuove tecnologie e ehm, ampliare l'accesso ai contenuti. Uh, so the directive is actually organized um, following the three prongs or the three themes. So first, again, we have the adaptation of exceptions and limitations. Then we have the improvement of licensing practices and achievement of the well-functioning marketplace for copyright. As you see, I, I uh, emphasize four points that are the most controversial points when it comes to the discussion and when it comes actually to, uh, to the proposal itself that we'll try to, to discuss in brief now. So it's the text and data mining exceptions, teaching and research or the teaching activities exceptions, press publishers' rights and a value gap and uh, or other no uh, known otherwise as filtering obligations or even the censorship mechanism. Ok, allora abbiamo tre eh, componenti principali nella struttura della direttiva. Il primo aspetto riguarda l'adattamento delle eccezioni e limitazioni ehm, al copyright, cioè i casi in cui un'opera può essere utilizzata anche senza l'autorizzazione del tutorale dei diritti. In particolare, due sono particolarmente importanti, la, il cosiddetto text and data mining, cioè eh, l'estrazione di informazioni tra grandi masse di dati, l'insegnamento e la ricerca, eh, le verità culturali. Secondo eh, componente, il miglioramento delle pratiche concernenti alla concessione di licenze e accesso al contenuto. 
e il terzo aspetto realizzazione di un eh, mercato ben funzionante e qui abbiamo due punti critici il diritto degli editori e eh, il cosiddetto value gap eh, le, eh, e l'obbligo di eh, filtrare i contenuti, cioè come sostanzialmente assicurare che ci sia un reddito, un proventi anche per chi crea i contenuti e non solo per le piattaforme che li distribuiscono. Uh, so going, going forward, the uh, first issue that I like to outline is the text and data mining exception, which is placed in Article 3. So what problem actually this, uh, this provision is intended to address is that the use of text and data mining technologies, so all the techniques for uh, exploitation and processing of land large amounts of text and data, which uh, enable researchers to discover trends, patterns, and other information which is uh, valuable for research, uh, those activities might infringe copyright and database rights. And uh, some countries do have exceptions to that uh, extent, however, they are not harmonized throughout the European Union. What the Commission proposed on that point is the introduction of a mandatory exception, so an exception that needs to be introduced in all the member states, which would cover the reproduction and extraction from databases <coughs> made to use those technologies but only by research organizations and only for scientific purposes. And one of the issues that has, has been raised uh, from the very beginning is that, yes, it's only limited to research organizations, which were very, very narrowly defined as universities, research, research institutes, or other organizations with the primary goal of research, which, uh, where this research <coughs> is actually carried for a non-profit <coughs> purpose, or is pursuant to a public interest mission. So in here we are talking about the public universities or institutes uh, or um, institutions that are actually not making any profit or reinvesting its profit in the research. Second is the issue of lawful access and what actually is lawful access? Does it, um, because only uh, when uh, those institutions have access to content in a lawful <coughs> manner, they can uh, use this exception. Uh, the problem is, is it only licenses or can it also be uh, based on other copyright exceptions and be lawful in that mm -hmm. manner? Um, and now we'll see... Oh, <laughs> allora, la prima, l'articolo 3 riguarda il text and data mining, cioè l'uso di, di tecniche, diciamo in qualche modo, di intelligenza artificiale per estrarre informazioni eh, contenute <coughs> in grandi a masse di dati, in questo caso protette dal, eh, dal copyright o dal diritto sui database. Pensate ad esempio nel campo medico, esaminare ehm, articoli in campo medico per individuare quali sono le tendenze, ovvero esaminare anche database raccolte di informazioni su, eh, su ehm, eh, pazienti o su ehm, insomma, eh, risultati di, 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 di sperimentazioni. Qui eh, è, in, la proposta è di introdurre una eccezione che ricopre la riproduzione dei contenuti e l'estrazione eh, necessaria per realizzare eh, queste ricerche, ma solo da parte di organizzazioni di ricerche per scopi scientifici. Quindi c'è il problema di stabilire quali siano le organizzazioni che rientrano effettivamente in questa caratterizzazione, organizzazioni di ricerca, e inoltre di stabilire ehm, un presupposto diciamo, per l'esercizio di questa eccezione consiste, ehm, 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 il fatto che si tratti che l'organizzazione eh, del caso abbia un accesso legittimo, legale. È necessaria un'autorizzazione a questo fine oppure basta un altro tipo di accesso consentito dal copyright, ad esempio sulla base di una diversa eccezione eh, al diritto d'autore? Uh, e poi misure, tecni okay. misure tecnologiche vanno. Okay. Sì. Uh, so now the question is how actually Council and European Parliament in its compromises reacted to that provision. In both cases this new exception has been approved, so it's in three versions of the directive that we have now under, uh, on the table. However, both Council and European Parliament added to the text of the directive Article 3A, which is uh, another co uh, exception for the text and data mining. However, it's an optional exception that would allow uh, all the public and private parties to actually use the text and data mining technologies <coughs> as long as there is no right holders restriction to the contrary. And this restriction can be taken in a technical or a non-technical level. 
Uh, apart from that, European Parliament here was a bit more harsh when it comes to lawful access, because it basically said lawful access to content, yes, but only for the purpose of text and data mining. So you need to have basically a license to text and data mine, and you cannot use copyright exception to say that uh, it's lawful access. Allora qui c'è stata una nuova eccezione approvata che consente eh, l'uso di ehm, la riproduzione e l'estrazione per l'uso di tecnologie di data mining eh, eh, a condizione che eh, non ci sia un, ehm, una limitazione da parte del titolare dei diritti. Quindi eh, al di là di quanto ehm, previsto nella sezione precedente che era limitata a scopi di a organizzazioni di, eh, di ricerca. E, ehm, e, e il, il, Parlamento, il Parlamento approva la nuova eccezione però eh, limitando l'accesso legittimo allo scopo appunto di effettuare e eh, usare tecnologie di, di data mining. Uh, going to a second, uh, which I think is very important, especially for educational <laughs> institutions, is the new exception uh, for the teaching activities. So the problem that the Commission identified <coughs> in here is the legal uncertainty surrounding the uses of, uh, digital, uh, uses of digital works in education, which actually hampers the development of new uh, teaching methods. And in here, what the Commission proposed is another mandatory exception, so the one that needs to be adapted by the member states, which would cover reproduction, communication, and making available, so the core, uh, core rights for the copyright holder, for the purpose of illustration and teaching. And again, as long as this teaching is non-commercial. So the issue is here, it's of course, what does it mean non-commercial? There is no definition, it's, it's, a, it's a big of a problem in here. Second, it only covers institutional forms of teaching. So we are talking about <coughs> teaching on the premises of the institution, or we talk about teaching in the closed network of the educational institution with the access only to teacher, students, and, uh, and, and pupils. So we are not even sure whether admin staff would, should have access to this network. And apart from that, this teaching exception would apply only if there are no adequate licenses available on the market. So basically, the member state has a freedom in here to decide. They can have the, uh, the teaching uh, exception adopted into their, um, into their uh, national laws, uh, but they also cannot, and they can give primacy to those licenses. So they are licenses that uh, are uh, easily available on the market and that uh, cover teaching activities. So basically, if we have uh, providers of materials who have licenses, we don't have an exception itself. But allora, passiamo alla ulteriore eccezione prevista per le attività di insegnamento. E, eh, questa è un'eccezione ovviamente molto importante per noi nell'ambito dell'università. E, um, la proposta prevede un'eccezione obbligatoria, quindi che tutti gli stati devono introdurre nelle normative che attuano la direttiva, che riguarda la riproduzione e comunicazione e rendere, avabile, rendere disponibile al pubblico, comunicazione al pubblico, eh, di ciò che è necessario ai fini dell'insegnamento però non commerciale. Quindi il problema è stabilire che cosa è un insegnamento non commerciale, quali istituzioni si qualificano. L'insegnamento deve avvenire nell'ambito di un'istituzione, anche qui bisogna vedere se ciò significa nel, negli edifici dell'istituzione oppure semplicemente in connessione con le attività dell'istituzione stessa e eh, questa eccezione però si applica solo quando non ci siano licenze adeguate, quindi quando il titolare dei diritti non eh, consenta di facilmente eh, acquisire i contenuti mediante, eh, mediante ehm, e c'è la, la, la remunerazione, in questo caso è obbligatoria. Oh, I forgot about that. Uh, so what actually is the approach of the Council and European Parliament? In both cases, the <coughs> exception has been approved. And there, wasn't, there wasn't that much discussion <coughs> on those exceptions, to be honest. So in the case of the Council, there are no significant changes. There is only a change of wording at some point, but no changes on the content itself. When it comes to the European Parliament, we have a bit of an extension, but only a bit. So we don't, the educational institutions, uh, Educational institution, okay, we'll try to speed up a bit. Uh, so this educational institution uh, can also carry its activities outside its venue, uh, <coughs> and uh, also our uh, licenses can be uh, made on the royalty-free uh, free basis. 
Ok, sarà so speed up. Ok, <ride> quindi il, una piccola estensione da parte del Parlamento consente che ehm, queste attività eh, didattiche che usano i materiali avvengano anche fuori dall'istituzione eh, dall dall di cui si tratta. Ok, so now we'll try to go to the most controversial, two most controversial issues when it comes to the directive. So it's the press publisher's right and the value gap proposal. I must say from the beginning that press publisher's right is very close to my heart and this is the topic of my PhD, basically. So uh, just to give you a very basic outlook. So what is the problem that press publisher's right is supposed to solve or what commission is saying is a problem? is that, that we, at this very moment there is a threat to free and pluralistic press and we need this free, uh, we need the sustainable press, uh, press sector, uh, especially since we have so much fake news around <coughs> us. So what we need to supply press publishers is the reliable licensing and enforcement environment. And what the Commission is proposing in here is the introduction of a new related right for digital users of press publications, which would cover making available of works and reproduction of works lasting 20 years after the publication. <coughs> Quindi un diritto per sulla ehm, riproduzione e la messa a disposizione del pubblico dei contenuti eh, in esclusiva dei, eh, degli editori che il cui scopo è di garantire appunto la retribuzione degli editori stessi di chi eh, realizza eh, opere eh, a stampa. And why is this provision so controversial? First, it operates with a very broad definition. We have a very broad definition of a press publication and a very broad scope of the right. So what the, the text is actually doing in there, we only operate by examples. It can be journalistic content, but it can be other content. It can be newspaper, but it can be something else. It can be on any topic, on any media. Uh, there is also lack of a threshold when it comes to this right, so what is being reproduced, there we have no explicit mention that it needs to be original or that there needs to be some substantial investment into production of those, uh, of those rules. Next, uh, we actually have the use of all the digital technologies, so it's not only activities online, but when I have the digital printer, it's also <coughs> a digital activities. When it comes to material scope of the right, in theory, it, uh, and how this right is actually referred to in most of the discussion, so-called link tax. So we have a bit of a problem when it comes to covering the links and covering when we link and share the content online, especially when it comes to fragments of works that surround uh, those works. So because this right covers also reproduction and doesn't say that what is being reproduced needs to be original, in theory, all the small snippets and all the small parts of the article surrounding the link can be deemed covered by this new right. Also, the, the length of the term of this right, it's 20 years after the publication, and as we know, the information is invalid and not, uh, and not so valuable after sometimes an hour and not 20 years. And also the, the, the right in the form... Okay, go for I'm sorry, I, I can talk a lot about this, unfortunately. <laughs> Ne possiamo parlare dopo. Comunque questo diritto quindi è una definizione ampia, eh, problemi di, non si sa, non si capisce bene quali siano queste opere a, opere a stampa, sono solo quelle a ventinatura giornalistica oppure anche altre opere e inoltre ehm, non c'è il requisito dell'originalità e c'è discussione se esso riguardi anche il diritto dell'esclusiva riguardi anche i link alle opere, eh, agli articoli di giornale fondamentalmente e anche gli snippet, quei brevi estratti che vengono, a cui accompagnano i link nei siti web. So the approach of the Council and European Parliament, the right of course it's there, we have some tweaks and changes here and there, we have, uh, um, we have attempts to only apply this law to informational society service providers, <coughs> but what is actually the provider, if I post by myself on Facebook, who is actually providing this link and this content, is that Facebook or is that me? Uh, we have uh, guarantees of authors share, for example, when it comes to European Parliament. We have attempts to shorten the term, but what is the most important is that the core of right is still there, and it even becomes a bit more dangerous, especially in the Council, in the council versions, when we have explicit exclusion of its substantial parts, and it's for the member states to decide what the insubstantial part is, so we can explicitly cover things that are not original. Okay, I will be sure. <laughs> 
Perché nella discussione se questo diritto si applichi solo ai contenuti originali oppure anche ai contenuti non, orig non originali, l'idea eh, che possa estendersi ai contenuti originali sembra emergere da quanto, da quanto indicato dal eh, Consiglio, in particolare che parla di eh, porzioni sostanziali senza specificare che esse debbano essere eh, soddisfino al requisito dell'originalità. No, no, it's okay. One minute, we finish okay. with that. Yes. So, uh, we're very sorry, we have more, but you can always approach uh, us afterwards. So, the, the last part and the most controversial part, I think, at this very moment is the value gap proposal. So, Article 13, so called at this very moment, the censorship machine. So, what is the problem of the value gap? Is that platforms are using content which is being produced by third parties, downloaded by, uploaded by, by individual users, and then those platforms supposedly are using it earning a lot of revenues and not sharing those revenues with the third parties that actually produced, uh, produced this content. So what the proposal is doing in here now, it, uh, it proposes an uh, introduction of an obligation to use appropriate and proportionate measures which would prevent the availability of these copyright protected works on their platforms uh, as content recognition uh, technologies. So for example, the content ID which is now being used by YouTube. So this obligation would apply to platforms which actually make available large amount of content and it would apply irrespective of liability exemptions from the e-commerce directive. Ok, so, già, arriviamo a questo punto all'ultima all eh, all nostra considerazione, eh, ci sarebbe dell'altro materiale ma non c'è tempo, quindi l'articolo 13 è l'articolo importante e riguarda la distribuzione di contenuti caricati da terzi, dagli utenti, sulle piattaforme online. Problema, le piattaforme guadagnano eh, un, un, eh, moltissimo, mentre invece gli utenti, chi carica contenuti, il content provider, non eh, gode di alcun beneficio. Come rimediare? Due linee, l'obbligo di eh, stabilire eh, licenze e ehm, l'obbligo ehm, eh, di eh, controllare l'usi dei materiali incompatibili con la direttiva, cioè la distribuzione di contenuti protetti dal diritto d'autore senza l'autorizzazione da parte del titolare dei diritti. Penso che ci dobbiamo fermare qui, purtroppo abbiamo ceduto il nostro tempo e comunque cioè, penso che se possa essere utile anche l'introduzione generale che abbiamo fatto al, all'inizio. Siamo disponibili comunque per qualsiasi domanda anche su temi ulteriori rispetto a quelli che siamo riusciti ad affrontare. Grazie per la vostra attenzione.